Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. My name is Eva Bernes Gempers, and I'm a junior research associate at the Cambridge Center for Animal Rights Law. As our usual host, Raffle Fassel, could not be here today, I will, I will be hosting today's lecture. So for those of you who are attending Talking Animal series for the first time, a quick note on the format. We'll have around a 30 to 45 minutes presentation, and then we will have another 40 minutes for Q&A and discussion. The event will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time. You are all warmly invited to participate in the discussion after the lecture. In case you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can either signal in the chat that you would like to say something, or you can raise your hand with the raise hand function. I will then go through the chats for the raised hands, and I will allow you to directly ask your question to our speaker. Until that point, I will keep all the attendees' microphones muted. We will be recording the presentation part of this event and later we'll upload the video to our website so you can always watch it again if you want. So that's all uh, as far as housekeeping is concerned. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker of today, Professor Saul Allian. Saul Allian is Professor of Judaic Studies and Professor of Religious Studies at Brown University. He is the author of an incredible amount of books and edited volumes, and recently he published a book on animal rights and the Hebrew Bible with Oxford University Press. Today he will be speaking to us about biblical rights, human and animal. So thank you for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. It's a pleasure to be here, to be back in Cambridge, if only electronically. Um, I, just a few words before I begin. Uh, this paper is pitched to a broad and uh, audience that crosses many disciplines. So apologies in advance. Please forgive me if I say things that you already know very, very well and that don't even need to be said. But the reason for that is because of how broad uh, the audience is. Um, in this presentation, I consider several examples of biblical texts that ascribe genuine legal rights, though narrow and targeted, to animals and compare them to other biblical texts that confer similar circumscribed rights to certain human beings. I also treat the one biblical text that I believe assigns broad substantive rights, what some refer to as fundamental rights, to both human beings and to animals. That text is Hosea 2 verse 20 in the Hebrew, verse 18 in the English. I foreground these texts for several reasons. First, because they have not been analyzed from a right-centered perspective to my knowledge. Second, in order to demonstrate that the notion of rights is native to the biblical text and an entirely appropriate lens for analysis. And third, to begin to map how biblical texts depict both human rights and animal rights and how the evidence might relate to a contemporary notion of rights both human and animal. I write partly in reaction to those outside of biblical studies who have criticized and even rejected the concept of rights and with it, rights advocacy as a means of socio-political change. I also write partly in reaction to those within biblical studies who have embraced such arguments. I begin with the definition of rights that I utilize. According to Gary Francione, a leading animal rights advocate and professor of law at Rutgers University, quote, we normally use the term rights to describe a type of protection that does not evaporate in the face of consequential considerations, unquote. In other words, genuine legal rights are not contingent on the needs or demands of others, 
They do not disappear suddenly or give way because of conflict with the interests of another legal person. They may not be violated with impunity. Genuine rights might be broad and substantive, such as a right to bodily liberty, a right to bodily integrity, or a right to life, things many of us tend to take for granted. Or they might be narrow, circumscribed rights extended for specific purposes. For example, for the purposes of contract or tort or habeas corpus. In either case, the possession of one or more legal rights goes hand in hand with the status of legal personhood. Legal persons bear rights, rights bearers are legal persons. Legal personhood may be limited, as in the case of a legal person who bears only one or a few rights, or conversely, it may be robust as with those who bear a panoply of rights. I should note as an aside that I am aware of debate about what constitutes legal personhood, but this is where I am in terms of my view of this. Do we have biblical examples of genuine rights ascribed to human beings and animals? I argue that there are a number of biblical texts that meet Franzioni's standard for genuine rights, ascribing narrow targeted rights to human beings, to animals, or to both. This might be done explicitly using distinct biblical rhetoric of rights or implicitly without using such idioms or technical vocabulary. Examples of texts that confer a genuine targeted right upon certain human beings using the distinct biblical rhetoric of rights include Deuteronomy 18.3, which introduces a, quote, right of the priests from the people, from those who sacrifice sacrifices, and goes on to list specific portions of sacrificed animals, the first fruits of grain, wine, and oil, as well as the first shearing of sheep. That Deuteronomy 18.3 speaks of a genuine right of the priests to cultic offerings for their upkeep is clear from the list of specific offerings that must be given to them, as well as from the use of the word mishpat in Hebrew, meaning right in this particular context, in combination with a following noun in the genitive as a distinct rhetorical construction, the right of the priests, mishpat ha-kohanim, for those who know Hebrew. I note that in other contexts, mishpat has other meanings, for example, ordinance, act of judgment, interests, or legal sentence. Given the range of possible meanings associated with this relatively common word, context is crucial in determining which meaning is most appropriate for mishpat in any given passage. In Deuteronomy 18.3, as I mentioned, it is right. Deuteronomy 21.17, among other texts, also illustrates this pattern of distinct rights rhetoric. In other words, the right of X. An explicit mention of particular things to which the holder of the right is entitled. The text speaks of, quote, a right of the firstborn to a double portion of a father's inheritance and makes it clear that this right may not be abrogated or transferred. The passage illustrates the fixity of the right by speaking of a hypothetical situation in which a man with a favored wife and a disfavored wife, each with a son, may not refuse to recognize his firstborn son as firstborn, even if he is the son of the disfavored wife, but must give him his double portion which is his due as firstborn son. And I quote, the firstborn, the son of the disfavored wife, he will recognize giving to him a double portion, unquote. The text states explicitly that the son of the favored wife, who is not the father's firstborn, cannot be designated as firstborn by his father in preference to the genuine firstborn son. Thus, the firstborn son has a right, a mishpat, to a double portion from his father and must receive it 
no matter how the father feels about him or his mother. 1 Samuel 8.11 is another example of both the use of the distinct rhetorical construction right of X and the list of entitlements following it. Here the text speaks of a right of the king, mishpat ha-melech in Hebrew, and I quote, this will be the right of the king who will rule over you. Your sons he will take and assign them to his chariots and among his riders, and they will run before his chariots. He will make them officers of large brigades and officers of small brigades. They will do his plowing and harvesting. They will make his weapons of war and his chariot implements." Unquote. The list of actions included in the right of the king continues with women drafted into royal service, the seizure and re redistribution of lands, a royal tithe on produce and other items, and conscription of laboring animals and slaves to do the king's work. The passage, often viewed as anti-monarchic by biblical scholars, ends with the observation that when the people cry out on account of their king, whom they chose for themselves, Yahweh, Israel's God, will not answer, the implication being that the king has a right to draft, tax, and seize property, however exploitative these actions may seem to the people experiencing them or to the writer or writers of the text. To sum up the argument thus far, Deuteronomy 18.3, 21.17, and 1 Samuel 8.11, among other texts, speak of narrow targeted rights using a distinct rhetorical construction, the right of X, coupled with an explicit statement of exactly what those rights entail. Furthermore, Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17, concerning the inheritance right of the firstborn son, states explicitly that the right in question may not be rescinded or suspended and is not subject to manipulation of any kind, a fundamental characteristic of genuine rights, as Francione has argued. Exodus 23, 6 is representative of a second group of texts that speak of rights, but employ a different but equally distinct rhetorical construction when so doing, to deny the right of why, in Hebrew, hita mishpat why, from the root nata in the causative literally to turn aside. Exodus 23, 6 states that you shall not deny the right of your poor person in his lawsuit, here, the masculine singular addressee, you, is forbidden from undermining, literally turning aside, the right of a poor person who brings a lawsuit against someone else in a formal legal setting. This is likely the earliest of a series of biblical laws that employ the idiom to deny the right of why with regard to what the text casts as vulnerable persons the poor person, the widow, the fatherless, and the resident alien. The following curse in Deuteronomy 2719 is one such example. Cursed be the one who denies the right of the resident alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Although texts belonging to this group do not speak explicitly of what this right is, it is implicit in Exodus 23, 6 that a fair and impartial hearing of a poor person's lawsuit is at issue. This interpretation is supported by another verse, Exodus 23, 3, from the same legal collection called the Book of the Covenant, which commands that, quote, you shall not favor the poor person in his lawsuit, unquote, suggesting the expectation of impartiality in legal proceedings. Along with texts that utilize the idiom to deny the right of why, we find one biblical passage, Deuteronomy 10.18, that employs what looks to be a companion idiom, to defend the right of why. Asamishpat why, literally to do or perform the right of why. In this text, which lists Israel's God Yahweh's characteristics, 
Yahweh is said not to play favorites, not to take a bribe, to love the resident alien and provide for him, and to be a, quote, defender of the right of the fatherless and widow. Similarly, in Psalm 140, verse 13, Yahweh, quote, will render the judgment of the afflicted and defend the right of the poor, unquote. A variant of this idiom utilizing a different verb appears in Jeremiah 5, 28. The right of the poor they did not defend. Thus, biblical texts speak explicitly of various specific targeted rights using discrete idioms such as to deny the right of Y, to defend the right of Y, and this is the right of X. X or Y may be a category of persons determined by heredity or by personal circumstances. For example, priests, resident aliens, fatherless persons, widows, or an individual, a firstborn son, the king, or your poor person. What these rights entail is frequently made explicit. For example, the right of the firstborn refers to a double inheritance portion, although not always. For example, the right of a poor person with regard to that person's lawsuit. At all events, it is clear that the biblical writers have a conception of genuine legal rights that is not altogether different from our own. These rights may not be undermined, suspended, or rescinded, and biblical writers make use of a discrete vocabulary and several distinct idioms associated with these rights. Aside from narrow circumscribed rights, communicated explicitly using discrete vocabulary and, discrete and distinct rights idioms, we also have examples of such rights ascribed to human beings implicitly rather than by using such vocabulary and rights idioms. An example of this is Exodus 21, 7 to 11, which speaks of the debt slavery imposed on a man's daughter and mentions several restrictions on the conduct of the master who acquires her, implicitly conferring specific rights upon the debt slave. The text states that if a man sells his daughter to another man as a slave and her master who has designated for her, for himself as a wife, ceases to want her, he cannot sell her to a foreign people. Furthermore, should he take another wife, he cannot diminish, the text says, her food, her garments, or her housing. Should he do so, the debt is canceled and the woman goes free without payment of any kind. The text statement regarding the woman's sale by her master to a foreign people is striking, given the way it is expressed. Quote, he does not have the power to sell her to a foreign people, unquote. Thus, the female debt slave who has become her master's wife has several implicit rights, not to be sold to a foreign people, to receive the wife, a wife's customary food allotment, garments, and housing, and the text uses a common power idiom to express a particular restriction it imposes on her master husband's contact, conduct. Excuse me. Now, what of animals? A case can be made that they too are ascribed narrow targeted rights by certain biblical texts, and sometimes these rights are shared by human beings in general or by certain groups of human beings. One example is Genesis 9, 8 to 17, a section of a hypothetical biblical source called by scholars the priestly writing, the priestly writings post-flood narrative in which Noah and his progeny and the animals on the ark receive a promise from God never to destroy the earth and life again by means of a deluge. God said, and I'm quoting translation, my translation here of the Hebrew, God said as follows to Noah and his sons with him, as for me, I am about to establish my covenant or my treaty with you and your progeny after you and with every living thing that is with you, 
birds, beasts, and every animal of the field with you, all who come forth from the ark, I shall establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off, meaning be killed, because of the waters of the flood. This is the sign of the covenant that I'm establishing between me and you and every living thing that is with you, unquote. The promise that, quote, all flesh shall never again be cut off because of the waters of the flood, unquote, is part of a covenant or treaty that God is said to establish in this text with all who are on Noah's Ark, a covenant whose sign is the rainbow. In my recently published book, Animal Rights in the Hebrew Bible from last August, 2023, I argue that the covenant of Genesis 9, 8 to 17 is grant-like in nature, adapting the unconditional covenant grant type well known from ancient West Asian literature and first identified by Moshe Weinfeld to suit the hypothetical priestly writer's purposes. The unconditional grant is a type of covenant between a suzerain and a vassal that requires nothing of the vassal and only obligates the suzerain who is giving the gift. In contrast to the normal suzerain vassal treaty type, according to which both suzerain and vassal must fulfill formal obligations. Unconditional grants typically involve rewarding an exceptional vassal for loyal service with a land holding, a dynasty, an office, and the benefits tied to it, or another gift that is everlasting. What are the implications of casting animals as covenant partners or treaty partners in Genesis 9, 8 to 17? They're on the ark. It's repeated over and over again in this pericope, this piece of Genesis 9, that they are part of this covenant or treaty. In my view, the text accords to animals a form of legal personhood, equal consideration of interests, and a particular protection. As covenant partners with Yahweh, with God, in other words, the God of the Bible, the animals on the ark are legal persons, for only legal persons can enter into contracts in antiquity as much as in the present. The interest of animals on the ark in living rather than dying, like that of the human beings on the ark, is not only given equal consideration by Yahweh, by God, it is prioritized above God's own interest in his freedom to act in any way he wishes at least with regard to sending another flood. In this covenant, strikingly, the interests of animals to live, for example, and not to die, to preserve their bodily integrity, to possess safety and security, are considered to the same degree as those of the human covenant partners with God. Finally, animals, like human beings, are protected by this covenant from one possible manifestation of divine tyranny in the future, the sending of a second flood. Other manifestations of the arbitrary exercise of divine power are not regulated by this covenant, nor does it accord to animals protection from human tyranny and violence, or to humans protection from the depredations of wild animals. Thus, Human beings and animals are both treated as legal persons by Genesis 9, 8 to 17, legal persons who possess one narrow and very particular right, not to die in a second deluge. Because this covenant is modeled on the unconditional grant type that I mentioned earlier, it requires nothing of the human and animal recipients of the promise. They simply receive the promise from Yahweh who voluntarily obligates himself to fulfill it. Thus, according to this particular grant-like covenant, animals can be genuine treaty partners, just like the human treaty partners, without being obliged to fulfill any obligations. A second example of a text that confers a particular circumscribed right upon both animals and human beings is Exodus 23, 12, 
the earliest formulation of the Sabbath law, except in this case, it is only certain animals and certain human beings that are the subjects of this right. According to Exodus 23, 12, the ox, the donkey, the slave, and the resident alien specifically are each entitled to rest on the Sabbath day, the seventh day. And I quote, six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease in order that your ox and donkey might rest and your slave and the resident alien might be refreshed, unquote. The motive for enshrining Sabbath rest in Exodus 23, 12 appears to be the need to limit the labor of working animals, slaves, and resident aliens, most likely in order to protect them from abuse. Exodus 23, 12, in effect, confers a limited legal personhood and a genuine and specific right to the human and animal groups of interest in the text. Furthermore, it appears to recognize the interest of laboring animals, slaves, and resident aliens in living rather than dying and in avoiding physical disability and seeks to protect them from one form of potential abuse by the landowner and or his family members, overworking. The interests of the workers, the animal, slave, and resident alien workers are given equal consideration to those of the head of household addressed as you, masculine singular, in the text. And although the interests of the workers and the head of household might be in conflict, especially during times of plowing, sowing, and harvest, the interests of the animals and human workers trump those of the landowner without exception when it comes to Sabbath rest, according to this law. Thus, the laboring animals and human beings mentioned in this law are cast as legal persons who possess a genuine right that does not give way in the face of competing claims of another legal person, in this case, the head of household addressed by the law. Where the landowner's economic interests the primary concern of a law such as Exodus 23, 12, it seems likely that the law would allow him flexibility in his decision-making about when to work his labor force, both human and animal. If he were behind in his planting or harvesting, he could make catching up a higher priority than resting his working animals, slaves, and resident alien laborers. But this is not the case. The fact that the right to Sabbath rest cannot be manipulated or suspended due to circumstances is a fundamental characteristic of genuine rights as Francione has characterized them. An example of a commandment not unlike Exodus 23.12 and the others under consideration here, that it is followed by a modifying circumstantial statement is Exodus 21, 12 to 13. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait, but God allowed him to fall into his hand, I will set aside for you a place that he might flee there. Deuteronomy 15, 19 to 23 is similar. Quote, any male firstling, firstborn animal, in other words, which is born among your herd or flock, you shall sanctify to Yahweh. But if there is a defect in it, you shall not sacrifice it to Yahweh your God, unquote. These two examples, one from the Book of the Covenant and the other from the Deuteronomic laws, suggest that were there circumstances that might cause a law such as Exodus 23, 12, the law of Sabbath rest that I just discussed, to be suspended or modified in some way, they might well have been mentioned through the addition of a modifying circumstantial statement, as in Exodus 21, 12 to 13, or Deuteronomy 15, 19 to 23, but such circumstances are not mentioned. One difference between texts such as Deuteronomy 18.3, which asserts a right of the priest to certain offerings from the people, Deuteronomy 21.17, the right of the firstborn to a double portion of his father's inheritance, 
And Exodus 23, 6, which speaks of a right of the poor person in his lawsuit on the one hand, and Genesis 9, 8 to 17, Yahweh's covenant with the human and animal survivors of the flood, Exodus 21, 7 to 11, which suggests implicit rights of a slave wife, and Exodus 23, 12, which accords a right of Sabbath rest to human and animal laborers on the other, is the texts in the former group speak of narrow targeted rights using the biblical idioms and vocabulary of rights, while texts in the latter group do not speak of such rights in this way. Thus, texts such as Genesis 9, 8 to 17, Exodus 21, 7 to 11, and Exodus 23, 12, texts that concern both animals and human beings or human beings alone, ascribe legal rights and personhood implicitly rather than explicitly. But the rights themselves, whether implicitly conferred upon animals and or human beings, or explicitly bestowed upon human individuals, groups, or classes of persons, meet Francione's standard for genuine rights. They all share the same substance. They do not melt away or evaporate in the face of consequential considerations, although the biblical text does not confer them in the same manner. Some are ascribed uh, explicitly, some implicitly. Some are bestowed using distinct idioms and vocabulary, some are not. In addition to the biblical texts that ascribe narrow targeted rights to human beings or to human beings and animals, whether explicitly or implicitly, using biblical rights, idioms and vocabulary or not using them, we have Hosea 2.20, 218 in the English translation, which stands apart. I translate the verse as follows. Quote, I will make for them, this is God speaking, Yahweh speaking, I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the heavens, and the animals that move on the ground. Bow, sword, and war I shall shatter from the land or from the earth. In Hebrew, the same word that means land means earth as well. So we have to try to guess from the context. And I will make them lie down safely, end of quote. This text, a utopian prophetic vision ascribed to the 8th century BCE prophet Hosea, appears to confer several broad substantive rights upon both human beings and animals. For example, a right to safety and security with the promise that Yahweh will, quote, make them lie down safely, suggesting a situation in which humans and animals will no longer have any need to be on their guard when resting or sleeping, times when they would be most vulnerable and a right to both bodily integrity and to life with the promise that Yahweh God will abolish bow, sword, and war from the land or from the earth, suggesting that all hunting, fighting, wounding, domestic slaughter, sacrificial slaughter, and any other form of killing will come to an end. In this way, Hosea 2.20 English 2.18 differ significantly from the various texts that I have been discussing that bestow narrow circumscribed rights on human beings or on human beings and animals. But not unlike some narrow targeted rights, the broader substantive rights conferred by God in Hosea 2.20 English 2.18 are implicit with no idioms or vocabulary of rights utilized by the writer or writers of this remarkable utopian text. Finally, not unlike Genesis 9, 8 to 17, the covenant or treaty of Hosea 2.20, English 2.18, is grant-like in character, with both the human and animal recipients of the promises made by Yahweh, the treaty's guarantor, required to do nothing at all in return for Yahweh's absolute gift of life, bodily integrity, and safety and security to both human and animal treaty partners.
Although the explicit rhetoric of rights is not used of animals in biblical texts, their rights and legal personhood are always implicit in the texts that mention them, the presence of an explicit rhetoric of rights in passages such as Deuteronomy 18.3, 21.17, and Exodus 23.6, passages that deal with narrow targeted rights for certain human persons or groups, clearly establishes the notion of rights as native to the thought world of biblical writers, suggesting the appropriateness of the use of contemporary rights discourse in the study of the Hebrew Bible and animals, not to mention the Hebrew Bible and human beings. And the potential of a focus on both animal rights and human rights to increase our understanding of biblical perspectives on animals, biblical perspectives on human beings, and biblical views of rights. Finally, I note that the domesticated animals to whom rights and legal personhood are ascribed in the texts I have discussed remain the property of their owners. For example, the ox and donkey of Exodus 23.12 who are to rest on the Sabbath. Presumably also the domesticated animals taken on Noah's Ark according to the narrative in Genesis 6-9. This is significant given contemporary debate in international animal law circles about whether animals in the present day can remain property and nonetheless bear rights. At the very least, the biblical texts that confer rights to domesticated animals are evidence that such an arrangement was conceivable in antiquity. They might also serve as examples for those who seek to strengthen and expand the rights that contemporary domesticated animals classed as property bear. That is assuming that you assume that they do bear rights. What these texts do not support is the idea that property status per se is wholly incompatible with rights and legal personhood, as some have argued. Let us now sum up and raise some questions for further thought. Texts of the Hebrew Bible or to Christians, the Old Testament, Old Testament is a Christian theological term, I don't use it, suggests a notion of rights not unlike our own in some respects. And a number of biblical texts make use of several distinct rights idioms when speaking of rights. In contrast, other biblical texts bestow rights implicitly. Biblical rights, whether ascribed to humans, to animals, or to both, are mainly narrow circumscribed rights, such as a right to Sabbath rest or a right not to be destroyed in a future flood. In contrast, Hosea 2.20, English 2.18, confers broad substantive rights, such as a right to life, a right to bodily integrity, and a right to safety and security to both human beings and to animals in the future nonviolent utopia envisioned by the text's author or authors. Animal rights and human rights are not infrequently paired in the texts I have examined. For example, Genesis 9, 8 to 17, or Exodus 23, 12, or the remarkable Hosea 2, 20, English 2, 18, which suggests that biblical authors were thinking about them together at the same time, an intriguing possibility given contemporary arguments that the first such common treatment of human and animal rights came in the Enlightenment or even later. Yet it is only narrow targeted human rights that are ever spoken of by biblical writers using distinct rights idioms, raising several questions. First, why are narrow targeted animal rights not spoken of using rights idioms as well? Remember, Animal rights are always implicit. Human rights, rights ascribed to humans, are either explicit using the idioms that I mentioned or implicit, like the rights of animals. Put differently, why should the firstborn son's right to a double portion of his father's inheritance be asserted explicitly using rights idioms in Deuteronomy 21.17? but an ox's right not to be muzzled while he threshes grain be asserted only implicitly in Deuteronomy 25.4, a text from the very same collection of laws, the Deuteronomic Code. 
My second question is this. Why are the broad substantive rights ascribed to both animals and humans in Hosea 2.20, English 2.18, not spoken of using rights idioms? It is impossible to answer either question definitively, though the questions themselves are certainly worthy of careful consideration. In the case of the first question, It may simply be an accident of preservation. The surviving texts conferring particular targeted rights, such as a right to Sabbath rest, to certain animals and humans just happen to ascribe such rights implicitly. In the case of the second question, the form of the text itself may help to provide an answer, as it is cast as a prophetic utopian vision rather than being an example of case law, a treaty document, or a narrative about legal matters. So we would not necessarily expect it to confer rights explicitly making use of the kinds of rights idioms we sometimes find in legal texts, including treaties or in narratives concerning promulgation of laws. Many thanks for your kind attention. I'm happy to hear your reactions and address your questions.